So I guess most of you have probably figured out that the topic for today is going to be the, th the wise men, the magi. I almost said three. We actually have no idea how many there are. It really rhymes well with me in that song. So let's go ahead and you'll see that we don't know how many, and there's no sense in that they're kings themselves. Let's read and see what the Bible says about the three wise men, and then we'll spend some time reflecting on it. it the uh, story is in Matthew chapter 2. It'll be on the screen for you. Praise the Lord, and a screen almost didn't happen today. 1 through 12. Sometimes you forget just how dependent we are on things like computer servers that we have no control over. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has born, been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means the least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will, be, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi, determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the Christ. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After, the king, after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Recently, I was sitting down to do some work and some chores when a friend of mine notified me that there was this great new podcast that I just had to listen to to help you stay more focused when you, get, when you want to get things done, when you have important things to do. So welcoming the distraction... I opened the podcast for great advice on how to stay focused more effectively to get my work done. So I realized the great irony of the moment when the expert began to share how much media distracts us. So it's one of those things that's just those, I'm only going, okay, got me right there, you know? Uh, staying focused in a world that really emphasizes multitasking, go look at job applications. De you know, they want you to be both detail-oriented and a multitasker. And that is a really dip. Some people, there's actually some people that can do both very well, but most people can either multitask, which, which doesn't mean doing something all at once. It means being able to qu switch quickly between tasks, or they are very, very focused. I've always been one of those people. I wish I could be one of those ultra-focused people, although sometimes they're kind of weird. Um, you know, those kind of people who are a professor that become so ultra-focused on one part of one animal or one thing, and they spend their entire lives becoming the world's foremost leader in the pinky toe. I mean, I don't get it myself, but I've always wanted, man, those, I've looked up to that, wishing I could have that kind of focus on something in my life. And uh, we may never... Most of us will never have that kind of focus on just one thing. But do you know, do you, if I ask you, what is the overall central focus of your life? What would you say it is? If you say, what is that main focus? I hope God this year can catch our, be our main focus, both individually and as a church. See, the Magi, these Gentile elite learners, were laser-focused people. 
they were focused first on the stars, right? I mean, that's why they were able to, God spoke that way. They're looking up there. And they got captivated by this celestial body that appeared in the eastern sky. We say star. We have no, that's, they only have one word for most of what's up there. So this, this thing appears in the sky. They likely knew enough about Judaism and the expectations of prophecy. They obviously, they knew something that it was intended for some great Judean king. And they were willing to risk their lives to focus and leave everything behind and focus on that one star and follow it and follow it. We, I mean, they probably came from Babylon. You're talking about a long place that they came from. And I think many Christians wish that God would put something so fascinating in front of them that they feel like they could focus on that thing and life's intense and they could pursue God in that way. We want a faith worthy of such courageous focus. Now, we all tend to have trouble with focus. I know most of us do. And you shouldn't throw off the idea also that we're to have well-rounded lives, right? I mean, like I said, you can get kind of, some of the people who focus all their energy on only one thing and never learn about the other toes, and they're so focused on the pinky toe, they become kind of weird. God wants us to have well-rounded lives. But if we're going to be honest, we know God is found and needs to be found in all the major areas of our life that we're looking around in. So rather, we are easily distracted and we need help to see and focus in on some area of our life where we have not yet imagined God is present. I want to look at two things that distract us, two things in this particular story that distract us from Jesus and then how to refocus some of our life, some of our faith toward him. So we have some potential distractions within us. These are some things that did not distract the Magi. I think there's some interesting here, things here. First of all, we are easily impressed by worldly importance, aren't we? Things and important people, when Elon Musk, who's billionaire, speaks something, everyone in the world needs, wants to know what it is. We're easily impressed by these big people. Now, Herod is called Herod the Great for a reason. People thought, not necessarily the Jews, but many people and historians have called him the Great because he built all kinds of things. He rebuilt and expanded the temple, for one. I mean, he wanted to be loved for that. He built a city on the port called Caesarea Maritima. He built the great palace and fortress known as Masada. Go look those places up. They're incredible places. He improved almost any kind of building project Jerusalem or Judea needed to happen. He was a kind of a master architect builder. He was the great. But these men were not that impressed. They, were, they had a focus. Because they were focused on that star, they, were, they met this man named Herod. And, well, yeah, okay, he's a king. Let's find what they want from him is information. I mean, when you think that you're the sole most important person in a whole area and somebody comes up to you like you're Google, you, you kind of get, he, he knows something's up. He knows he's threatened, right? We'll talk about that just in a minute, but, you know, most people would assume that this baby, that's probably why they go there first, that the baby that's so important, that's going to be a king, would, where would he be born? Most likely, people would think, in the important city, Right? Places like New York City, City, L.A., maybe even Dallas or San Antonio for us. But it happens just south of that main city in this tiny little place. Again, most people think that the important things that God has to do even, they kind of have this assumption that it's going to come from the elite, from the wealthy, maybe from the highest learner that they know. But these men aren't looking for just any king. And what keeps them focused, again, is knowing that they are looking for the king. My question is, what impresses you? What impresses you that would be a distraction from really pursuing Jesus? Where do you look when you say, Where, what's, what's God doing lately? Where do you go look for that? Where would you look for that? Would you go look for it in children? Or maybe the biggest, best scholar in the world. He can work in any of these places, right? Would you work, would, does he just work in big churches in San Antonio? Or can he work in small churches? 
Where does he work? The other thing that I noticed that they do not get into and they're not distracted by is biblical or what we call the mysterious, the things that we cannot know. We are easily distracted in our faith when we demand that everything be explained. Um, we have been attacked from a scientific naturalist viewpoint so thoroughly that it really has begun to take over most of our focus. Even when reading this text, we go, and trust me, I think it's an interesting question, but what is this star? This can't be a real story because we don't know what this star was. Was it a, some say it's an angel, some say it's an asteroid, some say it's the alignment of the planets. The best book and the best option I have is a comet, but who am I? I have no idea. And frankly, I don't care that much. This modern question on the ancient texts makes little sense. These men were asking why, not what is it, not how, all these things. They were going, why is this happening? We go, well, does God really speak through the stars? Are we... We have this sense, when we, to refocus, let's say this, to refocus, we have to realize that we don't know everything and about anything. We don't know everything about anything. Ask about light itself. I've mentioned several times. We could talk about energy. We can measure it. We don't actually know what light is. Here's the thing that's happened since time immemorial to today is that God has always chosen to lower himself to communicate on our wavelength. We live in an era of intellectual arrogance and dominance. We think, we got it down. We know what's right. We figured all this stuff out. Faith, and honestly, science, requires humility to realize that you're not going to know everything. 20 years ago, avocados were terrible for you. You're going to die if you eat avocados. Now they're like, eat as many as you can. 50 years ago, Freud, every elite person in America was basically going to their psychologist to go get and figure out their future or their deep insights using Freudian psychology. Now, even today, professional psychologists have said, Freud is, Freud is so yesterday. Freud's a, Freud's a loser. I mean, not, not quite that far, but might as well be. He didn't know what he was talking about. He might have sparked some things, but he, he was way off. How about Einstein overthrowing Newtonian physics if you're a science person? Did God, was God able to speak through those things and during that time and during that era in ways that we go, you know, that may not have been the, the, most, the best way that God could work? We have no idea. God may, he, he lowers and condescends himself. That's part of the incarnation. He condescends himself to us. He lowers himself. That's part of the whole Christmas story. How open are you to hearing God's voice? Or do you demand that he has to go through every scientific belief that you've ever had or uphold every other little thing for you to listen to him? Does there have to be some major aligning of the stars and this crazy thing for God to speak to you? Or can you refocus on this crib, on this boy, on this cross, on Jesus Christ himself? Is this good enough for you? becomes the question of the text. That becomes Matthew's question in the Bible. Is that cross is, and that resurrection enough to catch your imagination? To refocus, we refocus on him. First Corinthians says it this way, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And the star, that is like the perfect text for, for what they do, like in a literal way. But the star leads the magi to the fools. I love this part. So if you want to refocus, this is the next part of refocusing that you got to get. The star leads the magi to the fools with the words of wisdom and knowledge. Do you see that? He leads these men to these people who have words of wisdom. They just don't have, know what to do with it. They quote Micah chapter two, where the Messiah clearly comes from Bethlehem. See, they had to leave the star behind at this point. It's no longer a good enough guide. And what do they do? They go and they have to seek 
the revelation, the self-revelation of God himself in the, in the book of Micah. Focus on the star too much and you lose Jesus. Focus on that, that thing that God's doing that's so amazing, you get stuck on that thing and you, fig, you, don't, you lose sight of who's doing that thing. And over and over again, I think actually Herod's people do this right, but over and over again, you have to go back to the text. You have to keep going back and refocusing on what God has said he would do. Despite all the wisdom we might gain from the world, we are dependent upon God's self-revelation and his focus on saying, following Jesus. Now, this is particularly true for the church when we get caught up in all the ways that impress people. All the ways of the songs and the personalities and the stories and the cultures, which can all be good things, they can easily become what impresses us rather than our pursuit of Christ and his kingdom. You know, focusing on Jesus put all other priorities in the right place. That's the point. When you focus on Jesus, you're not like you're supposed, not supposed to do all the other things like I mentioned ago. It puts what you're supposed to do in its right context. You will discover, I think, when you're focusing on Jesus, when you're following on Jesus, that other things that you're doing in life will start to have fulfillment where once they were empty. Even going to school and you go, man, this math class is such a waste of time. Why does God have you in that math class? Why does God have you in that job you don't like very much right now? Why does God have you at home in a place that you're not certain you were ever called to? I can tell you right now, Jesus, if you focus on Christ, he, you can find him in every area of your life that he has for you. I think focusing on Jesus is kind of scary too. When you focus on Jesus, it gets kind of scary. And it's, first of all, it's really scary for those who worship themselves. The moment the Magi speak of a new king, it's almost like you can clearly see the treacherous rage in Herod just starting to rumble. I mean, you could tell he, he's thinking, his mind is going, how do I get rid of this guy? How do I, how do I think I, Jesus is a scary thing to this guy who wants everybody to worship him and to, to laud him and to pick him up. Any talk of another king, any threat, Herod destroys. Even before this happened, Herod had killed three of his sons, his own sons, because he thought they wanted to overthrow him and be king. He, there was Josephus as an ancient author in the ancient world, and he said it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. This dude was really caught up on himself, right? Even though he might have been called the great, he might have been called the great and terrible. He was a pretty terrible dude. Here's the thing. Nobody wants their power to be overthrown, right? Nobody wants that. Do you want your power in your life, your, your freedom to make your own decisions, if your, your own kingdom? Do you want it to be overthrown? Nobody wants to feel like they're being overthrown. He will go to any length of deception and murder, as we'll see, as you see later in the text. We won't be doing that next week, but later in the text, you see he goes and has the, the little boys in Bethlehem killed. He'll go to anything to jettison Jesus out of his life and out of his kingdom. And yet we see one thing that's very important for us to catch this morning. Jesus, Christ our King, is inherently political. I'll say that again. Jesus is political. He is going to be what? King. He is, he's not a person who accidentally gets caught up in the politics of the day. He is absolutely bashing the politics of the day as he goes out and about. It is, it, this isn't some misunderstanding of Herod because Jesus is basically, and the Christians are going to basically overthrow Rome and its religions in the next 300 years. Throughout the whole story, Jesus is in some way political. Now, when I say that, you have to, we have to be careful, right? Jesus, as I might say it, a nonviolent but very powerful threat to Herod. For in 300 years, all that's going to happen. But focusing our whole lives, public and private, on Jesus is going to draw hostility and criticism. It's going to do it. 
Many writers describe our secular age as the religion of self-worship. You have to think about this. They have to put these ideas together. Several sections of society do want Christianity totally removed from the public sphere and relegated solely to possibly the church and mostly your bedroom or your room or your office or your house. Not your office, just your house. You know, many Christians have bought into the idea because they, they, we all understand the separation of church and state is very important. And what that means is church institution, not your theology, not your doctrine, not the Christian ethic. That's what that was intended to mean. Here's the point. They, it, your philosophy, their philosophy are all part of the political sphere. In other words, they have no problem bringing their religion of public worship into the public sphere. I mean, their, their self-worship into the public sphere. No problem with it. Politics is a battle of ideas. It is a battle of ethics. It is a battle of who we are and what we stand for. And we need to be able to lovingly, gently, like Christ, represent him in the public sphere. So when you're told to be quiet and be silent, it's because they don't want to be overthrown. They are in fear of their lives being overthrown. And so what do you do? You try to jettison other people who are threats, just like Herod, out of the public sphere and into their private little homes. As long as Jesus would have stayed in that little house in Bethlehem, he would have been just fine. But Jesus came out. Jesus changed the world. He is inherently political. Now, this does not mean taking out the guns and going crazy. That's not that kind of political. You have to think of it as Jesus political in the way that he is nonviolent, loving, caring, but also stands strong in what God has, has established. We must remain resolved knowing that the following of Jesus will lead to ultimate real-time victory. In our era, Jesus does have victories. And we're looking and waiting. That's what Advent is about. It's waiting for that moment where there's complete and full and public victory. Where the whole world knows, as I read in Psalm 46, that the whole world knows that all nations know that he is Lord. But I have to be honest with you. Jesus is intimidating and scary sometimes just for me. I don't want to be overthrown. Do you get that? Jesus can be scary even for those who believe. He wakes me up. Sometimes when I want to sleep, he challenges me to the core. What is so scary about Jesus is that he reveals reality rather than hides it. And uh, his life diagnosis, he, he diagnoses evil. And it can be overthrown by him. It's so scary when the Bible and the Holy Spirit say to me, that, that right there in your life, that needs to go. And I'm like, I don't want it to go. That's my favorite. I really wanted that. No, that's not good for you. That needs to go. But I also love it, right? I love it too. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, you better get overthrown in some areas of your life. Those things better get out of your kingdom before you get out of control. That's what it means to accept Jesus in your life. You say, I want to be overthrown. I'm a lousy king of my own life. I'm such a lousy king of my own life, Jesus. I'll pray that you would come and you would overthrow me. I, I beat up other people at times and I beat up on myself sometimes. We say, Lord, I need a king more thoroughly judgmental to desolate the evil within me, but also I need a king more gracious than myself to love others and have grace for myself more than I could even have in myself. I don't have that much grace for myself as he has for me. I need that kind of king in my life too. Both judgmental, who, who knows what evil is, and he, can, he says that needs to go, but also more gracious to forgive it and, and to keep loving you. That's what it is to follow Jesus and to refocus on him. Will you focus on Jesus so he can overthrow some areas of self-rule? Are you going and you're talking and thinking about Jesus, hoping that he just overthrows your enemies and uh, builds your kingdom bigger? Because he's not about that. 
You won't find many stars to follow in your life if that's your aim. If you're interested in the latter again, you'll quickly lose focus on him. You'll go right back to where you were, the old paths of life. And really, when you see this, and I'm only going to talk about this for a moment, because it, I, I, whole sermons have been done on these three gifts, but focusing on Jesus ultimately leads to worship. These magi stay so focused on following the Bible and the star to Jesus, and miraculously, they find their way there, and the first thing that they, the thing that they really want to do is worship him. It's the first thing they do. And then they offer gifts. They give some really extravagant gifts, don't they? Did any of you get gold, frankincense, and myrrh for Christmas? I mean, that's, some of you might have got some gold. I don't know. But gold, frankincense, and myrrh, these extravagant, mostly extravagant gifts. But you see, once, these are not a reflection of the Magi's wealth, but a reflection of the value of Jesus. That, and that's where you go, sorry, song lovers. Uh, calling the Magi kings makes that exact mistake. People assume they were kings because these gifts are so extravagant. But that reverses what it's actually about. It's saying, Jesus, you're that valuable to me. The real contrast that you have to pick up on here between the, the Magi's worship is their encounter with Herod on one hand and their encounter with Jesus as king on the other hand. So the real the power of Herod, it comes from Rome. It's incredibly violent. And, and the star points out that Jesus' birth, even from a pagan viewpoint, is transcendent. And it's piercing into our heavens. In other words, Herod's power comes from Rome, this enemy. Herod's power comes from violence. Jesus' power, his kingship, comes from above. And so that's what they're really pointing out here. Focusing on Jesus does not narrow your worldview. It expands it. Connecting our personal lives to the community, the community to the cosmos, the cosmos to the, our loving God willing to die for it. Do you see that? Because he came from heaven. He came from this transcendent. He came from God. When you're focusing on him, suddenly also you're not just focusing on one Jesus, one Messiah. You're focusing on the whole cosmos. You're seeing bigger, grander, bigger than Rome, bigger than America, bigger than our world even. The whole cosmos is shining in this little baby Jesus from the star. Worship recovers that there's more to life than dust and energy, power and pain. When you're really focusing on God, you will find moments and times where things just come together. I often will be doing a sermon or have got done with the sermon and I'm in the back and someone will walk up to me and go, I was reading my Bible this week, focusing on Jesus. I was reading my Bible this week and I had some real questions about it. I was struggling with it. Or maybe I was really inspired by it. And you just came and you reaffirmed. Your sermon was like exactly the, on the same topic. I hadn't talked to the person. And, and it lined up or I answered their questions right then and there that they were struggling with. And what does that do? It, I'm not that sentient. I, I don't, can't read anybody's mind. And that feeling you get where you see the stars align, where you see things happen, you go, what does that do inside of you? You go, wow. And you have maybe even just between me and you that moment of worship that God has done something incredible. Maybe nobody else can see it, but you and I know that just happened. When you're focusing on Jesus, when you're going and spending time in your Bible and then you go with other people and you go into the world and suddenly what you just read is exactly what you needed to hear to handle this situation. And you see God and you experience him and you worship him. And I can tell you this, if you're not in your Bible, if you're not praying, if you're not do this, you are not focusing on Jesus. And therefore, if you do not focus, you cannot see. You will go, man, God works for other people. Wish he worked for me like that. You've got to focus on him. You've got to, he pull, for him to pull it together. For you to see something brand new. I want you to see something brand new. I want you to see a new path in your life. 
God told the Magi in a dream that for Jesus' sake to take a different road so as not to encounter the false king again. Now, you may have walked a hard road this year, and you need a new road, new ways, a new way of living, a new way of relating. If you aren't focusing on Jesus, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to walk right back down some of those old roads again. And I'll tell you this, if you want to write, if you want to take a new road, you're not alone. We're not sent off. These magi themselves, they're not one. They're magi. They're sent off together. You're not going to walk alone. We will walk together, following his lead this coming year. I want to encourage each of you to walk with us, following Christ. Our mod, that's our motto here. Walking together, following Christ. I want us to walking together, following Christ, focusing on Jesus. And there's several ways you can do that this year. First of all, in worship is one, but our discovery groups on Wednesday nights, also in the food ministry that we do. There'll be new ministries coming out. But I want you to know you're not, we're all trying to walk new roads and follow Christ, but you're not alone. None of us all have it figured out. I don't know everything about anything. And I got a lot to figure out myself, how to lead. I've got a lot of things to figure out about myself, about you, about church, about God. And I'm not walking alone, and you're not walking alone when we walk together following him.